Well, my heart is very open right now, and you all make me feel so privileged to be here, to be the Leslie Scalapino Scholarship recipient. Leslie, it is an honor to be linked to you as a woman in this way. I will remember the animal is in the world like water in water. Leslie, I want you to know I am hard at work showing people the animal in themselves. Maybe someday, when I too am disembodied, we can finally talk. Until then, I am grateful for my mother, for Ann Waldman, for Andrea Rexilius, for Jeff Pethybridge, for all of my teachers, for my cohort, and all the spirits. We show each other the way. Tonight, I'm just going to read one poem um, from my translation project that I'm working on. It's brand new. I wrote it uh, for Joan Kane's um, class. And um, I don't usually explain my poetry, but I think that in the spirit of the Leslie Scalapino Scholarship for um, women in poetics, women poetics, um, you know, this saga that I'm working with is very much about patrilineage and you know, I really want to give the protagonist, the female hero, her place where it has been demurred. Um, but also considering that it was Father's Day and we have this solstice and a solstice on a full moon, um, I, I just wanted to share this poem and leave it as it is. Opt er ulfer jungum sini. The moon, full passing in the memory fire, flame dancing up a crag, turned to wolf song, sung of wolf sun, became volsung, sing mourning over the haunted spirit, vigilance lost to hoary resonance, hair caught in chain, mail, help break there in the root, follicle repeating sympathetic magic, strengthening the blood, run with the wind, howling binds the pack together, ether, devouring surrender, bodies, consumptive, competitive, carnivorous, and a young boy lives a wolf. Ow! Ow, ow! Thank you. Um, I'm going to be reading tonight from a manuscript titled The Root Structure of Grief. Um, and as I found it extremely difficult to excerpt, I'm just going to start from the beginning. These are the stories I tell myself. One, I grew up beside a wash in a low-income apartment. I shared a room with my sister from when I was born to when I was 13, and from 17 to 19. From 20 to 21, I shared a room and a bed with my ma, although I mostly just slept on the couch. In between, I had a room of my own or shared one with a lover, interspersed with having no room at all. I slept on kitchen floors, beneath piers and tents, on the gorged roots of trees, truck beds, terminals, or else just stayed up, wandering around in the dark. As a child, I cringed at the taste of chocolate. I longed for an animal, but the complex wouldn't permit one. I too longed for a painted wall, maybe ochre or foam. The complex wouldn't permit that either. Two. When I was 15, my dad, Martine, remarried a 17-year-old girl from Jalisco. I wasn't invited to the wedding. Before the ceremony, Tiamago offered him $5,000 to leave the girl at the altar. 
Her family slept on rice sacks, seven to one room, in a house without windows. She didn't belong with us, Mago said, but he refused the money. It was maybe the first thing he ever did right. Four years later, I didn't invite Martine to my wedding either. I handed myself away. The man who married us dressed like Elvis. Jeweled rings littered his fingers. He also conveniently served as the receptionist for the Little White Chapel, our limo driver, and witness. Three, the first girl I kissed was Brie on the top bunk of her bed. The lights were off and we nav navigated each other's lips by candle. She stopped to instruct me to use more tongue. I complied. She's married now, and I wasn't invited to that wedding either. Four, I'm not afraid of heights. I'm just afraid of falling from them, which may or may not be the same thing. I also have a peculiar aversion to rubber. When I was in middle school, I used to download candid videos of real people dying. It's been so many years, and I can still remember each one of their lifeless faces. Five, I once called my friend to talk on the phone. Several minutes into the conversation, I heard her ma in the background ask who she's talking to. Angelica, she said. Who, she said. You know, she said. The one with the tiny house. Six, before he was my pa, he was a brown boy in the trunk of a car. He was an alien, an immigrant, a buggle of cargo and waraches. Upon arrival, Martine moved in with an older brother who had come to the States the year before. One of the first Mexicans in the city of Dana Point, which wasn't much of a city then. A small coastal community with a one block downtown and a sizzler. Once settled, his parents came to visit on a visa. Martine begged them to take him back, to return him to the rancho with the agave and the manure. They refused, comparing him to a tree. When it's small, his pa said, you support it with wooden sticks, but as it grows, it gets strong, and you take the sticks away. He was nine, I think, maybe 11. I'm not sure if Martine's story is my story, too, how deeply the Sierra Madres are embedded in twists of DNA, how imminent the confined space of the trunk is on my perception of the world. But I tell myself his story as if it were a footnote of my own, a source text to trace the origin of my body. Eight, the first boy I kiss is Quinny. Bree is on the bed too, egging us on. I remember our upper teeth smashing together and the uncertainty I felt regarding my hands. What were they supposed to do in moments like these? After, the three of us sit on top of the covers for hours. I stare at myself in a compact mirror. I feel like I should somehow look different. Nine, I went to the same school my pa got kicked out of in the seventh grade. He was failing English second language and the teacher may or may not have called him stupid. Either way, Martine told him he had a big nose and stomped out past the noon aides faculty parking lot into the street. He never went back. When I turned 27 and still hadn't, hadn't spawned or settled down in a track home or started making enough money to push me onto the desirable side of the poverty line, Martine told me I dedicated too much energy to grad school. Seriously, he said, picking food from his molar. Meet a man, shave your pits, get a life. 10. Needless to say, my pa has never read a book in his life. I used to read mail aloud, tax documents, notarized letters, bank statements, while he unlaced his work boots. He would nod and sign where I pointed my finger. It makes perfect sense that I became a writer, to be a thing informed by lack, an archivist giving words for what only exists in memory. I'll skip 11. 12. Martine gets a job arranging cut vegetables onto appetizer trays at El Adobe. It is the lowliest of positions available at the restaurant, ranking somewhere beneath dishwasher and above unemployment. He is 19 and, according to the story, breathtaking. 
The hostesses fawn over him in a language he can't understand. One even pushes him into the walk-in refrigerator during a rush. She unbuttons her top to expose pale breasts underneath, nipples standing full attention in, in frigid air, amid perishables meticulously labeled for food service inspection. The servers wear practical versions of charros. For women, this means full black skirts with billowy white blouses hanging from their shoulders. Allison is 22. She has already been waiting tables for years and is sleeping with a much older man. I don't know exactly how it happens, but I imagine her walking in on the hostess bearing herself to Martine. I imagine her forgetting what she had gone in for and, in spite of the temperature, feeling a deep flush crawl up her neck. I imagine the discovery being an unexpected tiny death and later delivering coin margaritas to table 26, replaying in her mind an alternate version her own blouse falling from skin. Thank you. Hello. I am reading from a piece, a manuscript called Neurotic Love Baby, uh, much of which you, many of you have heard in its beginning phases. Thank you for your fresh eyes and ears. Instructions for afternoon. One, face me. Loop a blood root neatly around my ring finger. Wait for it to crumble onto my ankles. Keep me still. Lace a rope through my lace a rope through my rib cage and anchor me, if necessary, to soft soil and pull. Someday I could take root. Someday I could be for keeps, for real. To let me hold your knees against each other. Do you feel my lifelines flooding with sweat, little rivers pooling in your desert hills? Three, little panic baby, give me your belly button, a snow globe shaking your dust down your elbows. Give me something fragile to fit in my palms. Homemaking. How do you feel about ferns? I would like them in all of my entryways. I would like a pocket for all of my stones. Isn't it silly? I keep trying to tell you. Dirt mixes with blood, dust with sweat, clump the body back together. So you read my legs. Do you feel guilty or do I? Do you remember if you said my thighs were fields of Saturdays or peonies? I remember they are the shape of sevens. You grip them by the handles. In the spring, we pluck the heads of roses and roll them into tight, leaking petal balls between our palms, offer them to each other as offerings. Here could be anything, could hold any sentiment, free memories. How many things do you own? Thousands. If you count the Corona bottles and the fake fireplace logs, an, iron, an infinity of more. I have questions for you. Is the inside of your cheek bruised from the violent sucking of dandelions or the soft erosion of your own tongue? You be a small desert, I'll be a city sewage tunnel. Climb through me to the mountains, happily ever after. Did you mean it like this? If my body is northeast Minneapolis and your tongue gets stuck in a peak nine avalanche, how fast does the freeway end? Doesn't a flower feel like a spectacle to you and doesn't a dug up carrot feel like a broken limb of the earth? Do you want to know how the valley of my hip tastes in the fluorescent glow of a pantry? Yes, yes, yes. Tell me a story. What am I always trying to get you to do to me? Panic. I don't think today is so bad, even though I've been jonesing to nurse from yesterday. I suck out the warm milk before it spills and spoils into memory. I just think if someone could tell me how to arrive in this present, how to arrive in the leather of this truck, how to fill these cup holders with my own hands, I would hang out with you so hard. I would unravel the octopus from your arm and suffocate you with an eightfold path to me. At home, we could get brave. 
We could tell your father about the addict and the attic shaking in a ring around the rosy pockets of Pyrex flesh wounds, cozy in a fetal fall. We all fucking hear him almost dying almost always from some shoddy blend, shit cut with his own exhales. We could get brave and almost solve something in a dream. Notes. Bucolic knees, the edges of your eyes go all field against ocean, petrichor breath. Tornado in your jacket sleeve, cell pastiche memory, blood, neurons, the lingering smell of cedar that has seeped into your skin and never rinsed out. Last minute savior, a fern stretched across your scar tissue. Notes continued. One, when I hold your grief, it sews a red thread into mine. Two, knuckles are hills if you want to salvage this. Three, crawl up and try to find eyes. Every choice is so big. Four, you, 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 you. An offering. I want to give you everything. Here, a warm plate. Here, the juicy snot of our cacti's fresh flesh wound. Here, an action shot of Barbie's pussy, an action shot of my pussy, a Glock wiped clean, an unbreastfed child, a wilting stain. Will you take these from me? I mean as a drug. I mean as a gift. I left a piece of tobacco in the belly of a hot red poppy for you. It was bulging with grief. Here, a dream. Panic. Your thumbs like torn paintings, your eyes, ponds stretched onto the plains of the Middle West. I keep drinking from the earth and ending up in your eyes. I keep clawing at the earth like I am unscrewing your spine from you, your fucking spine all broken. I will climb your vertebrae like stones. I will throw them like stones away from you. Get that body off of you. It hurts. It hurts. I almost lost you to the government. I almost lost you to paroxetine. I almost lost you to Chicago. I almost lost you to the highway. I almost lost you to a dream. Where's your guy? Goddamn bones, pull the bootstraps, we'll run, we'll run, we'll run. The best lovers are the ones pinching at their knuckles, examining the sensation of bleeding, pinching a little too hard. Dreams and grief and love things. Wouldn't you look tragic? In a Nebraska cornfield, all red and windblown and wheat-haired, a blood root tucked neatly behind your ear, wilting sun-drunk and crumbling down your eyelashes. As a child, you would lick everything you were curious about, car tires and light bulbs and dead wasps, until your dad said, don't be weird, and now you don't. But your tongue still appears earth-strung, especially when it reaches my collarbone, like it could recognize the rich flavor of a wound. Answers, yes. I want my hair pulled into a bow. Launch me into the snow puddles, tie a ribbon around me, and brace for either a containing or a breaking. You may choose any color, the redder, the ribbon, the more you will be unable to distinguish me from it. Do you want to know where I separate? Thank you. Um, so tonight I'm going to read selections from a chat book that I'm working on entitled Candle Glow. And in that chat book, I'm, it's a cross-genre mythology, cosmology that works through generational trauma um, and thinks about the lived experiences of the black and indigenous women um, in my lineage and how that becomes reenacted through my own embodiment. Allergy or what you can tell your folks about me when I'm gone. Yes, I know what it is to be born from cosmic woundedness. No, I don't claim to be a beam of light. You were there, so you should remember how our gods held us beneath their tongues like pills, like secrets, how he cried for them to set us free, how they refused to let us spill forth until one day before we could kick into their bloodstreams, they kicked us out, they spat us out, and we came out constellation. Yes, that's right, your kinfolks who ask about me should know. I come from the stars. No, I'm no beam of light. Yes, I'm the burning, but mostly the pockets of black heaven black ether in between. D 
DNA is just another theory for reincarnation, me sitting in a burning tree, year 4063. Prayer in the name of Mama and them, creatrix and goddess of Akrite. I speak in tongues, and all my tongues know all my names, so I know who I be most days. Sometimes I just forget. I don't have perfect memory, who does? Just a damn good one. Telling you now, you can trust and believe that shit. Telling you now, don't you forget that shit. When you sent for me, I came for you. Here I stand for you. Here I be for you. Yes, I turned my back against you. I had to go sleep in the belly of a well. Last night I had a dream that I got so bored that I began eating the well's flesh from the inside out. I sucked on the bones and I did not choke. I swallowed some and I spat some out. When I woke, I wept. What you will consume, what you will swallow down, what you will be swallowed up by when you can't digest the thought of yourself. I'm not proud of it, not ashamed neither. Admit it, you can't handle this shit. I mean, I be so oceanic, which is to say I be siren now. But she to say, hey now, why don't you come see about me sometimes? I mean, I've been singing songs, crooning comments, gurgling stars just for you, just for you. But you don't be noticing, do you? Because you don't be listening, do you? You don't know my name. You don't know none of my names. You must have forgot who I be, ain't you? Remember, I got a moon for a mouth. Remember, I got a sarcophagus for a throat. Remember, I inhale and draw ghosts from your nostrils. They're going to tell me secrets about the dirt. Remember, I must seduce the shadows from your eye sockets and make them spin around once, twice, thrice for me. Remember, I got fire shut up in my bones, and I got salt water shut up in my lungs, and I got my soul shut up in some flesh, and I got this body shut up in a wound, and that wound stays wide open, wide open. Remember, I leave from and return to the same place, always, nowhere, now here, call me nomad woman. Remember, I be nomad woman. Watch this, on the first day I be dancing, and watch this, on the seventh day I be dancing. I be dancing, I be dancing, I just be dancing. Watch me, I close my eyes and I see this is good. Watch me, I be good. And the following piece has an epigraph um, by Linda Paston, which reads, Ask the moon, ask what it has witnessed. And the title is, The Therapist Asks, When Did Your Depression Begin? Moon as my witness, I swear I don't know where, and I don't know when, except that I do. I'm standing in the middle of a field. Looks like the one that Granny worked in as a child. My skin is perforated. Blood is shooting out from the holes. People are all around me with cups prepared to catch it before the soil soaks it up. I can only move my mouth, I mouth, pour back into me, pour back into me. And they lift their cups to the sky. The sun burns it into water. They're in ecstasy over their alchemy, and they put it to their lips gratefully. It begins like this. My great-grandfather on my mama's side could pass for white if he wanted to. He didn't want to. He mouthed off to the police, and the police beat him for being an uppity nigger, and he died. It begins like this. My mother is just a toddler doesn't know many words yet, but refuses to let people, including her sisters, hold her. She screams, put me down, put me down, you're gonna drop me. Begins like this, I'm 21, and I tell myself to shrink so that they can grow. I tell myself that once they have grown enough and I have shrunk enough, I will have someone to hold me. Begins like this, I am 22, and I have found no one to hold me because I know that my mama was right, even before she became my mama. I know you're gonna drop me. It begins like this. I'm 17 and I tell this white boy about it, about my great grandfather. He asks, what happened to the cops? I say, what you mean? He says, did they go to jail? I say, of course not. I throw my head back, I scoff, I laugh bitterly. I'm 19 now and Trayvon and I cry bitterly. I'm 21 now and Eric Garner and Mike Brown and I cry bitterly. I'm 21 now and Ora Ross and Maya Hall and Freddie Gray and Charleston Nine and Sandra Bland and there's always more, there's always more there's always more and I weep, I weep, I weep it begins like this I am 18 and there's this black boy I love I'm 18 I think I need this black boy to love me I'm 18 and he doesn't exactly rape me I'm 22, I still don't know what to call what he did to me. I'm 21, and I'm afraid to name what that man did to me. I am 12, and it's the night before my 13th birthday. 
I sat in front of the mirror naked and watched myself cry. I know something bad is going to happen even though it hasn't happened yet. I'm 22. Ten years ago, I was right. It begins like this. Almost 50 years ago, the first person to show my father unconditional love has a stroke when he is six. At 10, he begins to take care of his grandmother and bathe her and feed her and comb her hair until she died when he was 16. My mama says that a part of him died with her. Do you hear me? A part of my daddy died when he was 16. Begins like this, my father's known no greater pride than being his grandfather's grandson. His grandfather didn't trust doctors because he shouldn't have trusted doctors. He was there for Tuskegee, so of course he didn't know until it was too late that he had prostate cancer. My great-grandfather died when my father was 35, and after that, there was no reason to stay in Texas. And since then, we've been in mourning. I mean, he's been in mourning. No, I mean, we've been in mourning ever since. It begins like this. I have a house underwater. In front of my house is a bonfire. The bonfire is my memory. The bonfire is my magic. The bonfire is my miracle. In my room, I can see the shadows of the flames dance across my window. I see silhouettes of bodies dancing around my fire. I think it can't be, it can't be. I'm alone here, but I can hear them. I can hear them singing and I can hear them laughing. I run out to join them, but they're not there. Nobody's there and my fire is out. I cry out, then I remember. I can't breathe underwater. I can't even swim. It's that moment, yes, that moment. The moment you realize how quickly everything that you call home can become your death, can become your tomb. Thank you. Yeah, the first poem I'm going to read is called 35 Millimeter. My sprocket twists and loads a spool with black and white memories. The first time we met, heart vibrated within our scarred knees and hummed a cradle tune behind orange clouds in the after rain. An eyepiece mirrors an illuminated face, shuddering each pose, filtering every curve of a natural smile. Gripping hips, one eye closed, and the other adjusts your shadow. Crows imitate each click as their own. One pupil snaps images and stores them in one chamber of 36 before I reload and shoot the next. Mixing over a thousand pictures the two years I've been with you, yet I've been performing my love in reverse. What if I process all the films and burn the rolls in a rusted barrel, allowing each portrait and landscape to ignite our beating souls until memories rekindle without a frame? Blocking a square hole to fixate every strand of hair needling your scalp, I trail them to the tips of my fingers, massaging frail skin, swimming on moist lips, crawling deep into a black hole where I ship thoughts bare dancing on taste buds. Sitting beneath the moonlight, thighs kiss. Two lives develop as one print. Bleed the truth. High-pitched voice in the background, under the haze I cast an ear, found in sweet breathless sound, was that a distant heim? Everyday music plays through my ears, world around disappears, eager shoes propel my whole, creates a story for everyone to know. Rhythms, beats, slow drums, rumble, stumble, lifts me on my feet. I begin to fly, quivers in the lives in the belly of my breasts. I can now rest atop a vibrant bass. Through sharpened eyes, find myself in a dark place, surrounded by other lives. Bells whistle, bells whistles, linger in your head, heads bobbing, weaving. It's the outspread of new music. Corpse rise from the undead, thrusting of blood, making way through the vein, down to the heart, a yorda sorta, becomes musical love. Clinging of loud thumps crawls within my skin. I itch away the stinging, soon becomes thin, dead skin, dry and flaky. Blood squirts out from my thumb, vomiting hateful words, twisting the volume knob. Music cures my well-being, you heard. Or will you sob? You want to hear my life story? Do you mind? It'll make your ears bleed. Even your own dark shadow will leave you far behind. The letter X. X is the ground, how it opens up. Cracks, travel, cracks trailing, crevices luring, and enveloping me with welcome desert embrace. It is lonely cemeteries with spirits lingering in curiosity. 
graves full of bones quietly shift in darkness as, heart, as hearts rot like raw meat and skins drown in soil. It is a wakened girl whispering soundlessly in the other room beside her bed on her knees, her own hands clasped together. It is like a growl where there are no mutts, like shoes with no soles in them, like a dress with no woman in it, like a shout with no mouth, tongue, or throat. It is blue waves staining white on a cliff, climbing heat, swinging and chanting, firewood crackling in a stove in grandma's hogan. It is dressed like a broom, thick threads brushing for crumbs, searching for a life. It is a ticking clock of two worlds humming for more and more hours of a good night's sleep, with children's faces tugging, tugging at clothes, holding wonder like a cup. It is for the years of loss, their spirits return in wings of a ladybug. It is revisiting the scent of pine trees, the eyes that love you, arms grasping, your memories that star the night, accompanied by a breath. And my last poem um, is titled, I don't expect you to understand, but listen. Our thirst was once parched, but they gulped down yellow water with minerals swirling in the cup for us. Our hunger was once starved, but they ate yellow cake for us and fed their bodies. Our sickness once passed by, but they still entered the mines with just a helmet to, to earn a pay and more bone, and more bone, lung, kidney cancer tackled them individually. Their livestock was born, sorry, their livestock were born with extra limbs or no limbs at all and they dropped one by one, their furs shed from their skin in handfuls. We say the wind feels good against their skin, but they inhaled radiation particles and they were clothed with tiny yellow crumbs, crumbs that seep through window screens in, in homes where a wife and children await their uranium worker. And we sit here, hydrated with clean water, satisfied with hot meals and fresh produce, we are, healthy. we are healthy with no light of cancer, and that still isn't enough. We tackle life, sorry, we take life and the earth for granted. We still live in that world with open uranium cesspools all over the nation. We still drink toxic water and inhale and exhale dust particles of cancer. We still live in a yellow, yellow cake world, a world that is slowly dying from wounds of chemical, uranium, and fire. It is a yellow cake world for many of us, and for many, not at all. Thank you. Um, so I am going to read from something that's um, completely brand new. Like, yes, wrote it, wrote it yesterday. Um, and it has to do with um, some of the things that have happened in my life in the past eight months. My partner was recently diagnosed with cancer. And um, so um, it's, an, it's an essay, so it's, it's more of an essay than a poem. And if I have time at the end, I will read a poem. After G was diagnosed with ocular melanoma, a rare eye cancer, I immediately became sick myself. At the beginning, I didn't anticipate how disease would prompt care labor so t totalizing and overwhelming. I accompanied him to all his hospital visits, made countless calls to the insurance company, sat in examining rooms, held his hand while he underwent bright lights, injections, anesthesia, surgery, radiation. I saw the careful excision of his humanity as the doctors ran tests, took images, and pronounced treatments. It was as if the doctors treating his cancer didn't, didn't notice him, only the disease. As we navigated the medical system, I grasped the adv advantageousness of his dis disease for the many different parties. The doctors, hospitals, insurance companies, medical technology manufacturers, the pharmaceutical companies all benefiting from his disease. And I witnessed his body submit as raw material for this productive process. In the early days after his, after his diagnosis, we spent night after night awake. The ground had opened up beneath us, nor, no corners to the rooms we now occupied, no safety, no comfort. Staring his death in the face, all our accumulated mutuality and togetherness on the precipice of total erasure, the balance of our lives felt completely broken. It felt as though he were being taken, and I would never leave him to do it alone. 
His prognosis called for a total investigation into the environment. What were the causes? How did it happen? Why him? Why us? The diseased body is always reaching out to seek its pathogenesis. Disease brings the body into inverted dimensionality. I became hyper aware of the body as an instrument that receives and begets, responds, and deforms. In disease, the biological, molecular, and viral modalities overtake the human as paradigmatic. We are forced to deal with biological particulars when struggling against illness. Death and disease strike a deep fear in Western capitalist society because they destabilize the myth of total control over unknown variables. Many of the narratives and projections accompanying the sick body are very similar to those attributed to the female body. Abject, dangerous, weak, helpless, in need of corrective rehabilitation via the use of specialized knowledge systems. Though we tend not to think of disease as gendered or sexualized, gendered meaning infuses disease. In disease, the body turns against you, the self, no longer master of the body, becomes displaced as locus of control. The medical system recaptures the body in a redemptive logic, which seeks to render the body gratuitous, an object, while also narrativizing the body's medical commodification as triumph. The circulation of the diseased body in the medical complex purports to bring the body back to health, save it, to return the body to its normal functioning. The promise of medicine is its mastery of the hidden realms of the body. It promises to deliver consciousness from its terrified preoccupations with the meaning of life and looming death, to deliver one to a normal functioning where the mind once again triumphs and reigns supreme. Um, those who make it are survivors having successfully battled cancer. The language of struggle against illness stages the body as a ground of technology, machine, and control against anomaly, dysfunction, and unregulated chance. Though his goal is survival, many of the weapons are the same, radiation, chemicals, incisions, propaganda. The story of survival is written by winners. Those who degenerate and die too quickly are unable to record their catastrophic ends. Although we are led to believe that medicine is what saves us from illness, medicine is another assault on the body we endure. It is an assault we endure as a consumer of its promise, life. We consume in order to become free again, to inhabit the freedom we're led to believe we once had and could have. Free from being victims, free from being invisible, free from dying. The panic induced by the body's divergence from biological safety is coupled with an atomization of responsibility. Under neoliberalism, health is something to be managed by the self and one's health is regarded as one's own personal responsibility. Under neoliberalism, one is expected to overcome illness through responsibly choosing the best corrective measures by being a smart consumer. To die under neoliberalism is then a failure in entrepreneurial endeavor and optimal self-management. Disease also proletarianizes. Why care about the future when you may not be alive for more than a year? What is a worthy life under capitalism? Disease strips away the conceit of a, tempor of a temporality defined by ascension, enjoyable work, professional development, and a future happiness. It takes inescapable illness, an indelible mark, to fall out of this time. It was his suffering body, his body under duress, his body slipping through the cracks that did this. In the days following G's diagnosis, I was strangled by fear. The temporality of a normal, enterprising bourgeois life was cut away from all our plotted comforts. The arc of his health would never be healthy until old, dying at the age of 80 or 90. Conceiving a of a life where happiness lies at some other point in the future was no longer possible. Dis disease destroys certain conceits about a worker's normal trajectory under capitalist conditions. The freedom to work and earn a middle income, drive a car, buy a home, have children, die of old age. A sick body requires care that is bodily and intimate. It requires crafting of new temporalities and new relations. A sick body requires others. The ill body is given new grounds and assumptions on which to build again a life. We also had to build on no assumptions. There may be no future. You may not live another year, another two years, another five years, another 10 years. The sick body is evicted from the productivist assumptions and priorities of capitalist society. Functionality, value creating ability. The sick body requires remedial attention. I tended to his body and his gravity. The sick self and the entrepreneurial will to live becomes a consumer of health goods, managing the statistical risk of death. I was one such arbiter of consumptive health. We are surprised when things go wrong with our bodies because we're trained to think we are masters of the environment and masters of the world, but biological and molecular tremors abound. Inundation of toxic particulates saturate the entire earth, land, air, water. The individualized management of risk is impossible when we look at the rising levels of toxicity. What guard do we have against the capitalist waste 
its system itself? How does the management of death dovetail with the management of our waste? In capitalism, these systems are closely related. The human value is subjugated to the logic of profit, so waste and death converge as sites of increasing dislocation. Planetary collapse and human collapse merge as the shadow of capitalist logic, our acts of consumption contributing to the rising toxicity of our biosphere. These are the statistics. One out of two men will have cancer. One out of three women will develop cancer in their lifetimes. Approximately 40% of the US population will develop cancer in their lifetimes. 100,000 people die of cancer each year. The same number of women die per year from only breast cancers died yearly during the AIDS crisis. Cancer is the second leading cause of death in the developed world. You will know someone who develops cancer. You will most likely find yourself at some point caring for someone who has cancer. You will know someone who dies of cancer. You will most likely yourself be besieged by illness and disease at some point in your life. The conditions under which you fight for your life or fight for the life of another human you care about will be humanly inadequate. These conditions are also ordered around a profit motive. Despite capitalist machinations to manufacture clean goods, real health is in rapid obsolescence. The present and future of this planet is disease and illness. Yet collective mourning, grief, or political raging against cancer is muted. Disease is yet to be brought fully into the political time or struggle time, as Anne Boyer calls it. Capitalism manufactures disease in pursuit of profit, and in managing disease, more profit is generated. Capitalism doesn't care if we live or die. Either way, it profits. It is because the body is profitable when sick that it is so intimately but so cruelly managed. Survival requires an apparatus, as does the manufacturing of illness and death. Contrary to popular thinking, cancer is not simply a disease of old age or of lifestyle choices. Cancer is a disease of the environment. It is a disease of capitalism. It is a disease not only produced by capitalism, but managed and overcome in and through capitalism. As long as capitalism exists, cancer is as inescapable as our biology. Cancer affects white people, people of color, the young and old. It affects all genders, people of all classes, and animals also. I kept thinking after my partner's diagnosis, why aren't we up in arms about this? If 40% of the population in the developed world are assured to develop a disease that is being produced by the very conditions that govern all aspects of our lives, shouldn't we be rioting? Who is going to help me overthrow the corporate leaders, try government officials for mass murder, burn down the banks, dismantle the nuclear power plants, abolish the use of cars and petrochemicals, recommit the military defense budget to funding research for cures, shouldn't we be more angry? The pathogenesis of cancer is very normalized. The existence of carcinogens is also normalized because capitalism is normalized. The exploitation of the Earth's resources, the release of, the release of petrochemicals, benzenes, PCBs, and ozonal radiation is normalized because industrial manufacturing is normalized because the conditions of life under capitalism are normalized. I have been, much, I have been having much trouble with this normal. This normal has made me more alone when I needed help, more destitute when I needed care, more marginalized when I most needed support, more invisible when I most needed recognition. As I supported G through his diagnosis, treatment, and subsequent healing period, I became more aware of the different temporality we inhabited from our friends. Ill, illness and caring for the ill evicts you from productive life. The productive world abandons you. People leave you behind in their continued activity. They go on with their lives, pursue their careers, write their essays, fall in love, fuck, take out the trash, do their laundry, go to work, read their comic books, talk about the weather and TV shows. His body was deformed by the radiation. Eight months later, his eye has not completely recovered. His left eyelid droops and his eye is bloodshot. The aftermath, the aftermath of brooking seven days of radioisotope iodine-125. He would joke about his bionic eye, but I knew better. It is difficult to talk about the self-other relation when you love someone. Boundaries become blurred during disease because disease has a way of seeping into surrounding biology. Love makes you porous in feelings and fears. I feel the terror the terror and the fear, the difficulty in continuing to hope, the rage. I did for him what I would have done for myself had it been me. I wouldn't have fought harder, read more, thought more, been more preoccupied about discovering where it would take me, this disease would take me had it been me. Um, and I'll just read a poem. Um, it's part of the same document. I know a carnal pentameter, how the body malfunctions. I coax innuendos from your pharmaceutical abatements. Undertaker, braze anesthesia. The land loses you the way the mountain loses birds. I am retention and sway. I wax maternal, I emanate aurora, a buffer against harsh bottom lines to come. Adjustments and judgments await you after your operation. You ebb tender into sleep, know nothing of the world that awaits you, but you've yet to care. You've always found the maternal inappropriate in me, but when I hear the fray in your words, I pardon you, I pardon you. What is the body proximal to heat? What is the body conjunct with moon and deadly weapons? What is the body electric, torrential in aggression, becoming monotone? 
The body discharges breath, phonemic and leaf-like, numbered. A week then as the days dwindled to a frigid horizon, a taut net caking the body, cleft, cleaving, unclipping, darkened, the horizon blue, color breath as lunar wool. To know death is to know its approach, its presence angularizing itself into shadow form, seeding gravity, boring obsidian holes. In nightly howl drowns the crackling warren of chipped rods and cones. The organs fall away until there is black pitch, the dark tryst emptying me, barreling instead of ear. The body letting loose, loosing in the pull of ban. The recomposition after machinic disjuncture and electricity moving to a new stage. I rage against it. What comes is a particulate fate, obliterating all detectable features and compacting terror as a band of perpetual horizon. This is my harbor, a region of total collapse. Frequencies do not abound here, stop short at the edge. Objects are incapable of manifesting their form. They devolve into fields beyond observation, all life reduced to an infinitely slim horizon. I, unfit to enter, stand outside this horizon in a non-dimensionality, dropping out of every known conclusion, every appeal to absorptive heterogeneity, outside days that convert settlements in predictable creeks. Annihilation comes after a state of being under siege. A siege has ontology. A siege is pure force, destituting all quarters of the mind. It steals wakefulness and poisons intention. I was a seeing me and could be as a seeing you. Now I don't know where to place my orchestral body, an instructive commotion inking the page of life. I would kill for a glimpse at unbroken wood. I was the worker that burnished your votive. I was the worker prostate, reproach to toxic commo commotion. Alone, I am a strident whir. I was the worker bending night to candle wick will. I was the worker that aggregated pestilent desire. I was the worker that stemmed the obsidian tide. I was the worker that gripped your fear, mauled the money bags, cursed the diseased foremen, abused the social factory, reconstituted the organismal norm to redirect the flows. I was the worker that tended your furrowed enfleshments, the cells that no longer shook. I unraveled your genetic code, misspelled the mutations, and dreamt of death. I was the worker that recorded your degeneration and witnessed your pain. I know a carnal pentameter, how the body malfunctions. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. So some of you may have heard this before, um, but I want to read it again. And thank you, everyone, for being here. You're Puerto Rican, but you don't look Spanish. I visited Puerto Rico once. Say something in Spanish. A girl in my school was Puerto Rican. I love margaritas, or is it piña colada? You know, I want to get married there. Oh, that's my favorite language. I don't know why I haven't learned it yet. <laughs> Hola. When did you learn English? Well, it doesn't really count if you're white passing if it weren't for your accent. Really? You can't vote for the president? No, I didn't know about Vieques. What's Culebra? I mean, the military had to practice somewhere. But why are you white? Would you prefer statehood? Are your grandparents American? Spaniards? Nah, you're not Boricua. Do you miss the beach? How does it feel to live in a city now? I bet life is good at home. How was it like to grow up gay in Puerto Rico? Did your parents kick you out? What did your dad say? Were you allowed to be queer? Is it Laura, Laura, Lara? Can you say it again? I'm sorry I can't pronounce your name right. I bet you like writing better in Spanish. Why can't we see your culture in your work? I think you could include more of your culture in this piece. You don't have to hide it. Did you write this first in Spanish? Did you have to translate? Could you include the translation? Then why did you come to New York City? What's the weather like in Puerto Rico during winter? Your license is not a valid ID. Thank you. <laughs> I'd be honest with you but I'd have to say it in Spanish. I dreamt your plane took off in my eyes, de cuando tus sombras se sienten en mi cuarto a contar las migajas de pan, and your turbines dug on my shoulder blades.
Por la noche me descubren. La soledad inquieta me despierta con un beso en la mejilla y tu avión a punto de despegar. I still save the breadcrumbs in case you need to find your way home. Al principio, solo importaban las distancias de tu boca a mi boca, de tu lengua a mis dientes, de, tu puerta a tu, de mi puerta a tu cama, de un sí a un no. Al principio, solo importaban las distancias de la verdad a mis manos, de mis uñas a tus lunares, de las arrugas en el ceño. Y solo importaban las barreras que habían entre, tu, entre mi cuerpo y el tuyo. Incluyo mis dedos torcidos, mi pelvis desalineada, mis oídos necios tu voz desafinada, tus gemelos cósmicos que tanto destrozaban tu carácter, el insípido sabor de tu antipatía a la terquedad que te mordía las muelas. Y dirás como siempre que no pierdo el tiempo buscándote defectos y diré como siempre que eres terrible perdedora. Al principio solo importaban las distancias y ahora estamos tan cerca que nos llevamos antorchas a la boca para recordar lo tanto que me querías. In the beginning, the only thing that mattered was the distance from my mouth to your mouth, your tongue to my teeth, from my front door to your bed, a yes to a no. In the beginning, the only thing that mattered was the distance between the tooth and my hands, my fingernails to your freckles, the wrinkles in the forehead. And there were only barriers between your body and mine. I include my malformed fingers, my misaligned pelvis, my foolish ears, your off-pitch voice, your cosmic twins that so much ravished your character, the insipid taste of your apathy, the stubbornness in your molar teeth. And you will say, as always, that I don't waste time pointing out your flaws. And I will say, as always, that you're a terrible loser. In the beginning, the only thing that mattered was the distance, and now we are so close, we hold torches to our mouth to remember how much you loved me. Yes. Thank you. So many of us share connections tonight. I will begin with night crossing. To walk outside, stillness crowning the air, silence singing, the snow reflecting your wounds like an unforgiving mirror. In time, a breeze so chilling, your bones turn dim, and you, you, Learn how to cradle your loneliness. How to make peace with an image you cannot recognize. How to transform your pale heart into a bleeding volcano. This is identity ruptures. My name is an utterance in the shape of a river. Its ring flows, adjust to the crevices of the mouth speaker. My name has never sounded quite like me in the mouth of a gringo. It is as if their tongue was too rooted in borders, fenced in, not open to vocal sensations. That unlike me, cannot be contained. I still wonder who they invoke when they call me. Then, sadness takes me elsewhere, a river. That is my name, too. My name swallowed opens uncertainty. It flows and stagnates. My name is like a gift box announcing a storm. Three. My name ringing somewhere. I die in their mouths, 
without ever being born. Desear recordar. In Spanish, recordar means to remember. It comes from the Latin recordare, to re-enter through the heart. Re for repetition, core for the heart. Amongst the things that I recuerdo are the losses that precede me, the pasts, its shadows on experience, displacements, diaspora, erasures, my unwanted birth clinging to my skin like a fetal virus, fatal virus, colonial hauntings that return, repuncture the heart, remain. Remember, remember the lives, the dilapidated screams resting like mud in the cracks of asphalt, succumbing to the silencing of your steps, O oh, giant imperial beast, father of amnesia. Generations of violence, deluge of my veins, I am learning to navigate these hurricanes of grief. I am learning that recordar, O oh, colonized heart, means reliving the dead unfolding in my body like ocean waves whirling to shipwreck. Thank you. Yat e shedena e Celeste Yinishe. Hi, my name is Celeste. Um, I uh, am really enjoying doing this, listening to everybody, uh, just super moved. And um, I would uh, like to share three pieces with you guys tonight. Um, I'm a little nervous, kind of going through some things in my life and uh, very socially anxious tonight, so please feel free to approach me after if you um, would like to say anything. Unless you have Indian questions, I'm not fielding those tonight. <laughs> Unless you're an Indian, then I would <laughs> welcome you. <laughs> this is modeled after my favorite poet, Natalie Diaz's A Woman With No Legs. A sister with numb feet, flips fry bread and grease vats at the Native American eatery, grins at the suburban whites who ask her, who ask how her people can eat such fatty food when they all have heart disease. Clicks her jaw between shifts to reel in a tongue serrated by nine years of saying nothing when he comes home wasted again. Names the baby in utero despite her mother's pleas to wait until the 21st dawn after birth. Blames her sister, friends, father, his coworkers, their Afghanistan, and herself for his thirst, an unstoppable eye that finds everyone but her. Sulks under a slick of gray that has drizzled onto her young locks from a cloud that followed her from Shiprock. Clutches the countertop between the lunch and dinner rushes to rotate each ankle in a circle like a swollen moon. Hums to Weezer like before she was only alive in dreams. Can't remember how to play Tchaikovsky's violin concerto in D, mi D major. Can't forget the day her violin's neck broke on another move to another bass. Pretends not to understand when asked who will watch her man while she is watching her child. Buys a blue crib to match her life. Orbits in her own galaxy without gravity or lungs. Uh, this is uh, a piece uh, based on historical events. So I'll just read the note. Um, on April 20th, 1914, the Colorado Feel and Iron Company, CF&I, owned by John D. Rockefeller, attacked a camp of 1,200 striking coal miners outside of Trinidad, Colorado. The laborers and their families were a part of the United Mine Workers of America and had been on strike for over seven months, withstanding a tremendous amount of intimidation and violence from the CF&I and the Colorado State Militia. 
Dressed in state militia uniforms, the CFNI thugs massacred the tent camp with machine guns at 10 a.m., burning the tents to the ground. 19 innocent people died on that Greek Easter morning, including two women and 11 children who suffocated to death in a pit that was dug under one of the tents to hide them from routine gunfire from the CFNI and the state militia. Many of the strikers were immigrants and a large number were from Greece. And I, um, this is the first time I've read any of these poems, but this one is, um, I want to dedicate to um, those lives lost. Ludlow's Lullaby. Easter dawn broke upon the exhausted camp. Miners were, are built to outlast, Papa said, when our blankets were bare against the winter's freeze. We had no eggs to hunt or treats to carefully trade. Us little ones were happy just to be, together inhaling spring air as the ground thawed for us. Purple crocus buds winked, snow melt tears. We picked up oval stones and pretended to paint them red. My brother, my brother gave me two of his five for a promise of a licorice rope. We sat together, opening up heaps of invisible candy, gorging ourselves between giggles on sweetness so real. Like a spring hailstorm, the snipers returned, and the loud copper popping stuck my naked soles to the soil. A bloody gust tore my brother into the crowd. I rushed below the tents. Shh, don't cry, agapite mo, said Mama, her coarse palm locked to mine. My eyes shut tight in the coal black of the foxhole. Hollow sobs and tiny screams billowed a familiar chorus, one we had practiced for months. My own cries hung in my throat, trapped under a, a sudden sharp breath of kerosene. The smoke clawed into our final hiding, grayer and less discriminant than death. The embers gnashed us like salivating vultures, irradiating the dirt pit red. We began to boil together in the only blood-colored egg of our holiday. Mama wilted, crooning, kama na 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 koimites, her sinewy arms weaving a basket around my chest, heavy under caving ash. I turned my cheek to her perfect neck, nuzzled amidst, nuzzled amidst soot and tears, and fell deep to the yoke, smiling. And this last one is uh, modeled after a poem in Claudia Rankine's From Citizen I. And I dedicate this, um, this is for, for my friend Mimi. Red Earth Women's Unemployment Blues. It's about three in the afternoon and you are four minutes late for an interview. What you always knew as the north side is now geometrically unrecognizable, spliced between yoga studios and nitro pubs. When you do finally find the high-rise loft office of the nonprofit bo nonprofit's board member, you find yourself in the crow's nest of an origami warship, parting the dwindling waves of familia to conquer another block of the barrio. The man waiting for you sits in his ergonomic swivel chair, eyes as cold as the industrial art fixed to his office walls. His hand is imported, much like his plans to level the rest of the city with high-rises and doggy daycares. Your best tie and skinny jeans dissolve in the, the acid of his first question. How are you with Mexicans, and for that matter, blacks? 10 plus years of finessing white talk crumple as your capillaries flood with machetes and molotovs. Ancestors army crawl from the ink of your forearms through a jungle brush of hair to steady the sights of their campesino rifles through your eyes. The job slides further away with every sentence, and your bills will go unpaid another two weeks as the urban developer philanthropically evicts a housing project to erect a Whole Foods. Chopping it up with your comadre over tequila, you tell her that you were asked if you were a member of the Native American church in a, a job interview last month. She raises her hand to signal another round and asks if you'd like to sue that culero for violating your rights under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. You consider this for a few moments and swig the rest of your drink. The jam of the summer comes on and your heads nod adelante. Cheers bounce between glasses and lips sink to the beat of a seated dance amidst the, the haze of e-cigarettes and indifference. Like a vision from an 80s PSA, Huera Pocahontas approaches your table, clad in a fringed pleather halter, fringed pleather miniskirt, 
fringed pleather boots and a dream catcher tattoo bullseyed with a yin yang. She offers you a sample of a local dispensary's new strand of weed, psychedelic peace pipe. You are silent, simultane simultaneously tempted to drop one tear like that make-believe Indian who didn't like litter and disconcertingly grin like the make-believe Indian in front of you now. She likes your earrings. They look authentic. The song ends and there is a landfill of silence before the next track. There is nothing to do but keep nodding. Ah, yeah, hey, thank you.